Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Come right on in, my friend. Glad to be with you today. And hope you're having a really wonderful day. And I would certainly like to give a special welcome to any who might be tuning in for the first time. Uh, first time or regular, regular viewer, and we've got a lot of those. Uh, we appreciate you so very, very much. And you know, today we're doing a program like none we've ever done before, because <clears throat> we're going to talk about one person, one personality. And my guest today is Dr. Tom Woodward, who probably is somewhat of a, a genius specialist on the subject of C.S. Lewis, uh, one of <clears throat> the greatest intellectual minds in history. And uh, a little slow to come to salvation, but when he did, it was all the way. You say, well, what are you talking about? Okay, I'm talking about this uh, book I finished not too long ago. This is a, a biography. And this one I have on my coffee table, C.S. Lewis, but it's got uh, four or five of his classic books in it. And as we mentioned some of those, you might say, oh, yes, I've heard of that. This gentleman um, is extremely intellectual and very, very successful in winning intellectuals to the Lord. I've never been accused of being an intellectual, but let me, let me read what some of the uh, secular publications have said about him. This is the New York Times. C.S. Lewis is the ideal persuader for the half convinced, for the good man who would like to be a Christian but finds his intellect getting in the way. Mm. This is from Harper's Magazine. The point about reading C.S. Lewis is that he makes you sure, whatever you believe, that religion accepted or rejected means something extremely serious, demanding the entire energy of the mind. And so why is Dr. Woodward talking about this? Because he has, uh, he has founded the C.S. Lewis Society, which uh, enables him to get in our schools of higher learning and present the gospel. If you haven't seen him before, you're going to love Dr. Woodward. I'm going to join Stephanie. We're, if you ever had one of those days where you needed a really quick recipe, just you just needed something you could get done in a very short amount of time. That's what we've got today. We've got a cheese broccoli chowder and it comes out of this book by Deborah Cody. This is an amazing little recipe book because all the recipes come in about 20 minutes or less and this is one of those and uh, we're offering this on the show for that gift of at least $20 uh, to the program. We'll get it right out to you. Uh, we've made, uh, Deborah's actually been here and made a few recipes and I'm telling you right on they always come in uh, less than uh, 20 minutes and quite good, quite tasty. So Let's do it. How are you? Good. How are you? You have those days where you got to have the quickest thing. I am you... to the point now that I just keep every. I want to keep everything simple. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. My husband's going to hunt camp this weekend. I am not cooking. Not one pan. What will you nothing. be eating? A cereal. I don't care. Oh. Anything that I don't have to cook. <laughs> I kind of remember. <laughs> I kind of remember. Well, this has onions in it. Yeah, and... I'm going to immediately put the onions in. There's a stick of butter in there that's we already melted yeah. and I'm going to put onions in there because yummy. Well, the professor and I followed the smell of onions in here. Yes. It, it almost makes your eyes water. It's but cooked. Mm, mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. Adds a wonderful flavor. So I'm just going to saute these. So we have frozen broccoli. broccoli. Mm -hmm. So this is how simple. Yeah. Okay. You cut a bag of broccoli open. You stick it in the microwave for a minute and thaw it out. Okay. Uh -huh. We have three cups of um, cheddar, cheddar cheese. Cheese. Three cups of milk. Is that right? Yeah. Three cups of milk and two cans of cream of chicken soup. Come on. Yes. Like you can't get easier. Okay? Right. Okay. And uh, let's face it. This is an entree. If you throw a good hard roll with it's, it, and it's going to be delicious. So I'm just yes, going to go ahead and start good. putting everything in because you have a very important guest to get to. Yes, we've we do. warmed up the milk. We've warmed everything up so we weren't going from cold. Uh -huh. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to put the broccoli in. And you know, Deborah told me that she tested these recipes each twice. Oh, really? Yes. And um, last time she was here, she cooked on the show and she made a couple of what. Well, I would call hors d'oeuvres, she calls munchies. Munchies, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you call it? Munchies, yeah. Okay. I, you know me, I'm a redneck. Yeah. Hors d'oeuvres. Anyway, they were exceptionally good. Really? Yes. Yeah. I would almost, if I were making this, mm -hmm. I might just start with a roux. 
-hmm. and just put a little flour in that at the beginning and make a little root and then it will thicken it up a little bit more. That would probably mm -hmm. be the only thing I... I might put about a tablespoon of Worcestershire in it. Oh, that would be good. You could put rotisserie chicken. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, this, things, this is so. very basic. Yeah, very so basic. I'm kicking this up. I'm going to pour this mm -hmm. cheese in here and we're going to get this heated up so you can try it. Let this cook for, a, you know, a lot longer. Well, when I, I mean, looked at the uh, ingredients in there, I knew it would be good. Oh, yeah. It smells so good. And don't, don't even if you don't like um, raw onions, because mm -hmm. I'm not a fan, uh -huh. man, the cooked onions add such a flavor. Uh -huh. So don't, don't not do that. Yeah. And if you could <clears throat> just smell it. Oh, my gosh, <laughs> really. And it wafts through the whole prop shop where the glamorous side of television yeah. is. We're kind of in the back because you can't move a kitchen around right all of our other sets you could move rather easily but you don't move a full working kitchen so we're way in the back so we have to walk through a prop shop to get here where yes, it yes. so I always tell everyone this is the glamorous side of television right but here. once you get past the fire doors your nose will lead you yes Jeez. big fire doors that remind me of like the Wizard of Oz mm -hmm. that's what <laughs> okay so now this isn't done but no not by any stretch of the imagination but I want you to try it there you go uh -huh. Oh my gosh, it smells. I'm going to try this because it smells it that good. It is awfully good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The flavor it's an, is so good. And you all realize it's got a, it should simmer. I'd probably let it simmer 15, 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, at least. We're, we cooked it for what? One minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's good. Yeah. Could you imagine if it cooked for 10 or 15 and minutes? And you can have this absolutely free. Uh, it's called cheese broccoli chowder. And like I said, it's very, very hearty. And as we make this program, we're getting ready for autumn. It's like a perfect... Um... Come fall, come. <laughs> come on. We're ready for you. My, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. So ready. My favorite season. Green again, it is cheese broccoli chowder. And it'd be very easy to have all of these ingredients on hand all the time. So... Uh, email's the best, but everything else is coming up, and we'll be glad to get it out to you. And then if you haven't met him, we're going to meet Professor Tom Woodward. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. I'm happy to welcome back to the program Tom Woodward, and if you have not met him, uh, stick with us. I uh, think you're going to be impressed with a lot of things. I want to talk about you before we get to C.S. Lewis. Uh -oh. Okay, okay. <laughs> Embrace. Uh, professor at Trinity College in Florida, um, and you were, you said not quite an atheist, but... Close. Yes. Okay. What was it that led you to Christianity? Well, when I was in my freshman year, I actually encountered some Christians. Some of my fellow freshmen were involved was this in a Princeton? group. Princeton? Princeton Evangelical Fellowship. They've mm -hmm. changed the name to Princeton Christian Fellowship. And they were active and they were teaching actually about creation. And I thought, creation? Well, I can see you know, someone believing that if they want to biblically. But they were saying scientific evidence supports this. And I said, no, no way, Jose. And so I was kind of uh, confronting. I even met with the leader of the group, 78 years old. Were you born in a Christian home? I was raised in a Christian, yeah, in, a nominal Christian home. But you kind of went to church. You kind of didn't buy it. Catechism, communion thing. And, and by the time I, w I was a junior in, in high school, I was an agnostic. Now, so. didn't you have uh, some point in college that you wanted to convince people? I wanted to convince them that they were just That wrong, evolution wrong. was a great thing. Evolution was a <laughs> fact. I mean, they, however you want to fit it into your faith system. Uh-huh. And they really didn't, they answered that quickly, but they came back with Isaiah 53. They came back with a clear explanation from Romans and John. And I had never heard the true... What's the, what's the scripture in Isaiah? Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray, verse 6, everyone has turned to his turned own his way, way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or as one version says, God has caused our sins to attack him mm -hmm. instead of us. So he paid the price, he, he bore the debt. And I had never heard a clear explanation. And, and he raised, was raised from the dead, you know, the proof, eyewitness proof. And this is all new. I mean, believe it or not, mm -hmm. just hadn't heard that. And so after uh, fighting it and discussing for six months, kind of this ongoing debate, I trusted Christ. 
at the end of my freshman year in May or first week in May. So you kind of had to lay your plans aside to convince everybody. Oh, well, they were, they, were, they were being laid aside <laughs> step by step, and then the Lord said, hey, now is the moment. And I said, do I have to make this decision here in front of you to the guy at Princeton right off campus? And he said, no, you can do it privately. I said, I might as well get it over with now. And I mm -hmm. prayed to receive Christ. Mm -hmm. And I told God, I said, the f one thing, Lord, I just want to let you know, I'm not going to be involved with this Prince Evangelical Fellowship. They're all a bunch of creationists, and I'm a Darwinist. <laughs> well, God showed me within a matter of weeks that I was on the wrong path there, too. And so uh, I, I wanted to explain Tom's background because this um, explains a little bit why you were kind of drawn to C.S. Lewis. Right. And uh, so much that he has created a C.S. Lewis Society where you go in and speak in colleges, indeed in many parts of the world, and this is a target to intellectuals. And We are deliberately targeting those who are what we call the doubters, mm -hmm. the skeptics. We're also targeting, and there's a lot of overlap, students. It could be, in some cases, high school students. Uh, we've done some speaking there, but especially university students. We've uh, spoken to universities in 35 countries, mm -hmm. uh, 70 or 80 thereabouts. But our ministry is also to even uh, professors. We want to even pray and ask God to reach out to the leaders on the campus. Yeah, because they they really have a blinding because of their great intellect. It can that, be a stumbling block uh -huh. to under, understanding the simplicity, but the powerful truth of the gospel. And we have more intellectual firepower in our, our apologetics. By the way, our ministry was actually started at Princeton three years after I graduated, a group of students founded it. C.S. Lewis Foundation. C.S. Lewis Society. Society. And then we, of course, sort of inherited. They, they passed the baton to us, and we kind of revived it from a long, uh, let's say, hibernation mm -hmm. and brought it to Florida well, when I started teaching at Trinity some uh, years back in mm -hmm. 1988. And... Uh, Tom Woodward is also an author. Uh, you wrote Doubts About Darwin. And Darwin Strikes Back. And, and more recently, so you, wrote on DNA, the, the third right, book. Right, and you've been uh, in many countries um, talking to people that the only thing they've ever heard is evolution. In many parts of the world, uh, that's especially all they, Eastern Europe, yeah. uh, actually in Western Europe, just about as much. Uh, that's all that, I mean, they're told it's fact. I mean, it is established. You can't challenge it, which, of course, is really absurd now, in my opinion, because Darwinian theory is in a state of, of unraveling. You know, it's on the, exactly. near the edge of collapse. Uh, you also wrote a book with our mutual friend, uh, Dr. James Gills. Gills, on the epigenome. And y your pronunciation is perfect. I'm going to give you f 15 bonus points. Well done, <laughs> epigenome. Well, I means, did do a good test. Well, uh, I did do a good test. Facebook test recently, <laughs> so maybe I'm an intellectual. <laughs> so I actually brought... Yes, and I, I want uh, you to show I'll this. i mention it. We've, I think, shown it on a previous program, but this time it has its tight twisting tubes. There we go. And, and there's so, uh, 150 million of these in my body, right? In every cell. Can you believe that? There are 21 rungs in this DNA ladder, and to multiply that times, times 150 million for one cell, mm -hmm. and then multiply that times 35 trillion for your whole body. And right. to that believe amazing? that that just happened. That's right. <laughs> so these are available for special rate as a Christmas <laughs> present for kids who love educational toys. Well, I think it's important that you get that out every time you possibly can. Um, people gradually get educated mm. on these things. I understand that in the uh, evolution community that when this epigenome, well, even when DNA was mm -hmm. uh, kind of shook, shook a lot of their... It shook the foundation. foundation. Now they said, oh, if it's just our Mendelian genetics theory, mm -hmm. but the more they thought about the, the quantity of mm -hmm. digital information, it's mathematically identical to a computer code. So that's one thing C.S. Lewis didn't know about. But what Lewis did know about, if I could just transition back to Lewis. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so Lewis really understood because, I mean, this is all discovered, the structure in 1953. And Lewis uh, died in 1963, the same day that Kennedy was assassinated. So in the, his final two decades, really the last 30 years of his life, he exploded with all kinds of very creative, uh, powerfully written books. Mere Christianity, for mm -hmm. example. That was radio talks in nearly a mil million people every night. And we're talking about a total of 30 talks over a couple years. The entire British nation was listening to the gospel. And the, and the Christian truth from the Bible. Lewis knew the Bible, I think, better than I know the Bible after studying it my entire life. He was a very unlikely oh. to be Christian. Absolutely. I read his uh, I read his biography and wasn't really raised in anything that 
no, going, going through a nominal, uh -huh. you know, kind of, um, you know, church background. But he went in that to a okay, tunnel now, of atheism. Okay, now, at what point were you uh, attracted to his ministry and his intellect enough to found uh, the C.S. Lewis Society? We refounded the C.S. Lewis Society in 1988 at Trinity College up here in Newport Ritchie um, because we felt that there was a need for a, a U.S.-based but globally, um, let's say, disseminated network of witnessing to the message of C.S. Lewis that comes from not only his writings but his life. When did you first learn about him? Well, I began in my like junior high years in high school, screw tape letters, mm -hmm. which is the, the imaginary I correspondence between senior demon and junior yeah. demon, uh -huh. how to tempt their guy in England. But then uh, his, his book, uh, Out of the Silent Planet, my brother had a collection of science fiction books. Lewis was the, one of the co-founders of science fiction. That's a rare known mm -hmm. fact. And then as I learned more and more about Lewis, his, his use, how God used him in World War II to reach so many people. And then after that, through the Narnia tales that were seven of them, written after 1950, he was just exploding. Lewis's impact was exploding at every conceivable academic level. Did he ever move to the United States? He never visited the U.S. He had many oh, really? invitations to come. Didn't he have radio programs here? Well, there was, uh, I mean, radio was up and running. Um, some of his, I think, broadcast talks, well, YouTube mm -hmm. is, is a place where people today can actually hear Lewis's four talks, each about a half an hour long, on the four loves. Mm -hmm. So if anyone wants to just put on YouTube search bar, I would say uh, do a um, search for the four loves C.S. Lewis doodle. Mm -hmm. because there's a guy who is actually doodling everything you hear Lewis say. Mm -hmm. says, one of his Mere Christianity radio talks in the 40s is preserved. You can just put Mere Christianity radio talk, and you can actually hear that. It's about 15 minutes. So Lewis's voice is preserved, but it's his, his, his life with all of his writings that has a global impact, and it just grows year by year. What is it that he says that maybe an ordinary evangelist says uh, that reaches this certain group of people, higher learning, academia, intellectual. Wow. <laughs> uh, because there's, there's no question. And, and, and you take his, his words and, and mm -hmm. his life and his experience into these institutes of high, higher learning, mm -hmm. and people pay attention. Well, Lewis takes the biblical truth and he retranslates it maybe into the lingo of the 20th century, but we can still you know, appreciate it in the 21st century. And Lewis is basically, he's saying like, Jesus um, will um, shock you. I love the way he uses the word shock. Uh -huh. And he actually wanted to call the Mere Christianity radio series, the art of being shocked. I've never heard an evangelist say that. No, uh -huh. no. And so, and he uses the, even the argument for morality you know, Romans 12, uh, excuse me, Romans 2, 14 and 15 says the works of the law, the requirements of the law are written on the heart so that men know what's right and wrong. Well, we know that we violate that. So he sets up the gospel two ways. He lets you know that there are, there's stuff in the universe more than molecules and atoms. Mm -hmm. It's called moral values and we break them daily. So he sets you up for the gospel. It's so clever the way he does that. And then he brings Christ right on the stage and focuses on what Christ claimed to be. Christ accepted worship. Christ said he's, he was eternal. Christ said he was sinless. Christ said he was the I am. Christ said he was the Messiah. He says an ordinary man can't be good and just a mere man and say these things. He's either bad or he's God. The Lord, liar, lunatic dilemma. And so, I get it. And so one of the things I teach in my apologetics course, I said, let's go ahead and sketch this out. And we just draw a kind of a tree, upside down tree. And the students say, wow, I can use that with my, first, you know, with my cousin. I can use that with my atheist friend um, and Twitter. And so Lewis provides a whole array of weapons, of little lightsabers, you know, if you may think of Star Wars, mm -hmm. power tools that we can use to just upset, you know, in a loving way, the apple cart of the comfortable agnostic. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, when you, do you duplicate some of these things when you get into these situations? I mean like use mm -hmm. Lewis's ideas mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I they find still work. <laughs> they do. And, and Lewis um, never passed up an opportunity. Can I share the story about him serving MI6? Sure, sure, sure. So not many people knew that Lewis was a bit of a 007 during World War II. Mm -hmm. So the British MI6 Secret Service actually employed him 
to make a series of broadcasts. Actually, there were, there were recordings on these old-fashioned records, you know, phonograph records. And we didn't even know this existed until somebody bought through eBay, eBay from a Reykjavik Iceland collector uh, one of the records. It's the first and only known surviving record from 1941. When Lewis made these recordings about the commonality of Iceland and England and their common heritage or culture, basically saying, don't rebel against, you know, Britain. Britain had taken control of Iceland to keep Nazi ships from seizing it. And, and basically, you know, the people of Iceland said, oh, you're right, as they were listening to this record. Well, he served the Lord and served his country faithfully. He, he will, kept them from Hitler? From, from Hitler. And they, and they were aligned with and comfortable in line with England during that whole World War II period. And part of the key reason was Lewis was willing to serve his mm -hmm. country and to serve God that way. He had a heart of service where he was writing hundreds of letters every year, and maybe even up to a thousand every year. And we have three volumes of the collection. And he just said, God told me to do it. I want to obey the Lord. So to me, he's an ultimate, like, true Christian. Yes, and we talk about his ability to reach the intellectual and all this, mm -hmm. and, and even you, when uh, you were mm -hmm. great doubter, you can't discount the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> even in the in Narnia books, <laughs> the gospel is presented through Aslan, mm -hmm. who was killed at the stone table mm -hmm. because of the sin of, of Edmund, who represents us. And yet he's, he's raised from the dead and begins dancing after the resurrection, by the uh -huh. way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about his personal life a mm -hmm. little bit. Uh, when you read his autobiography, uh, before he was became a Christian, he certainly needed <laughs> to become a Christian. Well, he, he actually said at one point, he wrote a book called uh, Surprised by Joy, which is his pathway. It's like his testimony. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, got what, 12, 15 chapters. And in that, uh, he, he's, he was really devastated by World War I. He was badly injured, almost killed. He, he was in the service, in the military. Military, in World War I. And a, a bomb, a shell, actually a British shell, fell short, mm -hmm. landed near him, blew up his uh, first sergeant, and injured him for the rest of his life. He was in convalescence for six months. Mm -hmm. And in that period, he wrote, the, the ugliness, the awfulness of war showed him that there was no God. How could there be a God? The argument from that, evil. That confirmed but, yeah. what he already he, believed. So he said... I, I didn't believe in God. I thought that, thought that God did not exist, and I was angry at him for not existing. Mm -hmm. You get the, the uh -huh. humor? <laughs> okay. And so then he says, in that same breath, he says, but and I realize, where did I get the idea of good or evil? If God doesn't exist, there should be no standard from which to judge anything truly good mm -hmm. or truly evil. Mm -hmm. And then he said, that began to work on me. And it was Tolkien, the famous J.R.R. Tolkien, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings trilogy, The mm -hmm. Hobbit. And it was through Tolkien's relationship with Lewis that he finally realized, number one, God is real. He gave in and admit that God existed. And in 1931, September, in a late night walk with Tolkien near his college at Oxford, he said, I do believe that Jesus rose from the dead, mm -hmm. and he's my personal Savior. Amen. If you've just joined me, uh, this is a little different program than we've ever had on mm -hmm. Homekeepers, but... Um, Boy, it's interesting. I mentioned to Professor Woodward before the show, we could do a whole week on it, but uh, we're talking about C.S. Lewis, a man who has had such an impact on Christianity. Mm. Would you say worldwide? Certain, certainly in uh, Britain and the United States. We are one of 120 societies around the world named after Lewis. And the, and the growth of his books, his 35 books that he wrote, seven Narnia and 28 for adults, <laughs> yeah, I, grows y year after year. And so uh, the, 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 it's like a tsunami. I uh, read uh, somewhere uh, the Narnia books like in the millions. Oh, millions upon millions. Mm -hmm. So let's pray that that uh, next one, the, um, mm -hmm. the silver chair is made this year. I'm mm -hmm. hoping it will be made as a movie. What is your... Um, thoughts about these important subjects uh, for the intellectual, but also um, Darwinism, evolution, and all these things. The truth is evolution, Darwinism, whatever, is losing its moorings. There's yeah. so much scientific information the, coming out says it's not true. The scientific evidence is running so strongly against Darwin's theory that it's near the end of its rope. It is nearly unraveled to the point of collapse. 
and I could explain that a hundred ways. Let me just mention, there's a, you, you know, a house of cards is, is pretty fragile, mm -hmm. can fall. There's a really good book, I'll just mention it, mm -hmm. Tom Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L-L. -L. Tom Bethel's book, The House of Cards, Darwin's House of Cards, is a beautiful, it's a tour de force, a brilliant overview of this entire falling apart that's happened over the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, since you've been on TV with me. Oh, it's been accelerating. And I think the rising generation, which is just told, don't question the theory, don't question the theory, they're not going to take it. They're but they're begin. still teaching it in our... Unfortunately. Uh, and, you and, name it, Harvard, you, Princeton, wherever. You can be fired if you question the theory. I mean, you can be, you know, yes. if you don't have tenure, you know, the kind of the permit status. And it's just sad. But this too shall change, you know, if the Lord tarries. Well, pretty soon you can't argue with not just truth, but with scientific facts. Yes. And the DNA model that I just held up a moment ago, that's just one snippet of what is in effect a three gigabyte, three billion letter hard drive that is in every one of our 35 trillion cells. We are massive mountains of information. Mm -hmm. we're, we're souls, you know, we're spirits that last eternally. But Christ, isn't it great that Christ stepped down and took in on himself one Amen. of those bodies with uh, 35 trillion cells and all that DNA? Um, it's just amazing that we have the privilege to learn now how yeah. fearfully and wonderfully made that we are. We only have a, a couple of minutes left, but for anybody in our audience, maybe they have someone in their family mm -hmm. that really is truly intellectual and he has these honest doubts. Mm -hmm. He's not just being obstinate, mm -hmm. but honest doubts. Uh, would you suggest getting them a copy of Mere Christianity? I've heard that's the one that... Let me make four suggestions. May I do okay, that? Okay, we got one minute. Okay. 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 Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Fantastic. There's another modern book by Greg Kokel, K-O-U-K-L, called The Story of Reality. Mm -hmm. It's like a modern version of Mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. So Kokel, The Story of Reality. And then we have two versions of what's called The Case for Christ. One is a yes. documentary, and then one is the full feature film shown in movie theaters hoping of Lee Strobel's. An, hoping to get an interview with him <laughs> later story. this year. Yeah. All four of those are fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, this would be better than just arguing <laughs> around the table. It would be a basis for discussion. Uh -huh. And I think yeah. that that give and take is what the Holy Spirit often uses. You know, it's always wonderful to have you on. Uh, you. Just uh, really Lee. appreciate your ministry and... Um, that you're out there pushing apologetics, which I think is so, so needed in the church. But time's up. So join me next time, remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.